You're all very welcome to the School of Classics at UCD. It's great to have so many of you here on the call. And without further ado, I would like to introduce you to Associate Professor Martin Brady from the School of Classics. Over to you, Martin. Thanks very much, Ema, and uh, welcome to everyone. It's fantastic to see so many of you here. Uh, we don't often get such good numbers out at an open day, so it's fantastic that so many of you are so interested in the things that we're going to be doing in classics. Some of you, I imagine, would have studied the subject before. Maybe quite a few of you, you're new to classics and you want to find out what the discipline is, what it involves. So I've got a slideshow that I'm going to show you. Here we are up on share screen now. I'll talk you through what classics is some of the key artifacts and some of the key kind of themes that were studied in the pursuit of classics at UCD and also some of the highlights of the UCD facilities for classics, including our excellent museum, which Isolt Devaney here, who works as an assistant curator, as well as being a fourth year student on the classics, art history and archaeology program, is very well placed to tell you about from a student perspective. So we'll come to that in a moment. But first of all, just to define what classics is as a subject, it's not that easy because there's so much we'll look at. But what we'll do is we'll focus particularly on the ancient world, this area of the ancient world that you see in the map here, Rome and Greece and all of the areas on its periphery. And we'll look at them in the periods of the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, right up to late antiquity and right up to the fall of Rome itself towards the end of the fifth century AD. So it's a large chronological scope, but it's also a large geographic scope because we're also interested in the civilizations which interacted with Greece and Rome, which were the leading civilizations of the period. But there was significant interaction with other civilizations such as Persia to the east, such as uh, Egypt to the southeast, such as Carthage to the south. So within this large scope of essentially the ancient Mediterranean world across 15 centuries and more, what we like to do on the UCD Classics program is we like to focus on the major monuments, the major artifacts of antiquity. We'll look at the most significant and well-known key people of the ancient world. We'll look at significant and well-known historical events, such as the conquests of Alexander the Great, such as the work of Julius Caesar, such as the Roman Emperor Augustus. And we'll look at key monuments, key artifacts, key buildings and features, which are just as well known in the contemporary world as they are in the modern world. The one which I want to talk to you about today is this one, the Great Sphinx of Giza. Not because it's a core part of our subject, though in a sense it is in that Egypt interacts significantly with the Greek and Roman worlds, but I just wanted to tell you a story about how this artifact and myths connected with this artifact are picked up, are relayed across the whole Mediterranean world, are of significance to Greece and Rome, as well as Egypt. And this will give you the scope as well of the kinds of subjects, the kinds of topics that we talk about in a classics course, themes of art and architecture, themes of monuments and monumentality, themes of myth, of stories, stories about ancient monsters and divinities like the Sphinx here, which is a representation this one of the Pharaoh uh, Khafre uh, from the 26th century BC. So for the Egyptians, this would be an object of veneration. It is intended to stand guard over the Pharaoh's own tomb. And as these monuments in Egypt represent this kind of conflation of a human head and an animal body, this is how they represent and conceive divinity. So this is an object of worship to the Egyptians that we'll see becomes a monster and an object of fear to the Greeks and the Romans. But it's a significant kind of object from antiquity. What fascinates us all about antiquity, what's the most interesting uh, aspect of antiquity to interact with are the monuments, the objects, and the pieces of its material culture that it leaves behind. So though we don't have anything as grand as the Sphinx on campus, we do have a museum, quite an extensive museum, a well-stocked museum, and a museum that's set up for teaching and research every bit as much as it is intended to display these ancient artifacts. There's a couple of pieces from this museum with the Sphinx on them and which relate to the story of the Sphinx that I want to show you in a moment. But I think it would be interesting to hear from Isolt at this point as well. Isolt is, as I say, a final year student on the classics art history and archeology span module. So has had extensive experience of being taught 
and learning in the museum and also have extensive experience of working in the museum is also our social media officer she writes the tweets which we put out on the museum account twice a week and also has experience in organizing and looking after the collection so Isolt, why don't you tell us a little bit about the museum from a student perspective Thanks for that great introduction, Martin. Um, yeah, so the my name is Isil Devani and I help out in the Classics Museum as an assistant curator. Um, so the museum's great because it is really interactive and I'm going to post a link just in a minute um, with an interactive map of the museum. Um, so you can have a look at that. But yeah, so I really like the museum because it's given me kind of an opportunity to put it on my um, CV. So basically what I do at the moment is we have a exhibition, an art exhibition going on in the museum and it's called the Museum of Ancient History. Um, so this is a great opportunity for me because my pathway is classics, art history and archaeology. Um, so it incorporates both the art history side with the art exhibition and then the classic side with the museum. Um, so I have to write tweets and kind of advertise this on the um, UCD Twitter. Um, and it's just a great museum in general because it's a very welcoming space. So you come here for some of your tutorials. Um, Dr. Joanna Day, she's the curator of the museum. And um, she kind of is full time there. And she, um, if you ever have a question about the museum, she's the person to go to. Uh, we've got a lot of ancient Greek and ancient Roman stuff there and ancient Egyptian stuff as well. So it's the kind of place that you drop by and you could spend hours there or you could spend, you know, a few minutes looking at a certain thing. So we've got a lot of coins. We've got a lot of pots. We've got a lot of um statues you know we've got we've got a lot of stuff in there so i would definitely encourage you to drop by if you choose to do classics or even if you don't choose to do classics um so yeah it's great for me as a student to be able to put this on my cv and uh, we have an internship um opportunity as well in third year um so you can sign up and apply for that when you're in third year of of the ba course and um, that's a great opportunity to kind of have a whole um, semester doing uh, museum experiment experience if you're interested in that. But um, yeah, if you have any more questions, um, type them into the chat and I'll be happy to reply. Thank you. Thanks very much, Isolt. And I hope you all found that uh, all of you uh, a very good oversight of what you can get out of this course if you're studying it from a student perspective and what magnificent opportunities are available in the museum to get some experience working in this area. If you want to look at the museum directly, we have a virtual tour of the museum in place of the physical one that would love to give you in different times. But here you should be able to see on your screens, this is the classics corridor. This is where my colleagues and I work and will interact with and teach you. And if we turn back and to the right here, I can take you through the museum front door. I can show you on the right here, for example, we have this uh, late Roman uh, stone sarcophagus. I am told that it's big enough to fit one student inside lying flat. I'm sure I don't know how the students were able to get that information, but uh, there you go. And a lot of gravestones as well and grave stelae. We have a donor from about a century in the past who bequeathed us a connect collection of Greek and Roman tombstones who had quite a macabre interest in the area. So if you're interested in studying the dead, this is a very good place to come. On the left here, we see uh, some cabinets containing amphorae and vases and other artifacts from the classical world. This is an exhibition that was put together by students on our master's program. So there's an opportunity to get involved actively in studying the classics through the museum as well. A whole range of other artifacts. I don't have time to take you through them all one by one there. But for example, in front of us at the moment is a selection of written materials, linear B and cuneiform more vases, more fragments, and at the back here, a collection of coins. We have 400 on display at any one time out of a collection of something over 2,000. So I'd like to show you in a moment uh, both an amphora fragment, a vase fragment, and a coin to talk about the Sphinx myth. 
But you can also see as well this table at the back here, because this is a teaching museum and a research museum. This is where we hold classes. This is where we would teach you. And this is where we would hold research seminars where folks talk about the latest cutting edge discoveries in archaeology. But to look in more detail at some of the things that uh, you might be studying as part of the program and what classics involves and what the study of it entails. Here, as I say, is something in particular, an artifact from the ancient world, which illustrates the kinds of things we study, the kinds of questions we might ask of materials in antiquity, and also the way in which we see stories, myths like the Sphinx myth spreading through the ancient world. This is a pot shirt. It is a very large fragment that broke off an amphora. Many of you may already know what an amphora is. Of course, it's a vessel for containing water or olive oil or very often wine. This one probably would have contained uh, wine. Uh, and it's something that you use to transport these materials on a large scale, on a large basis across the whole of the Mediterranean world. So this one here, it was discovered, if you look at the map on the right there, at a place called Tel Defenna in northern Egypt, somewhere in the Nile Delta. We know from the clay that it was manufactured in Turkey, but we also see painted on it uh, a fragment of a Greek myth. And you might be able to see there the wing of a sphinx, and you might be able to see the lion's tail curling out on the bottom there. A sphinx in Egyptian thought is a combination of a lion's body and a pharaoh's head. But the Greeks take this creature and they reinvent it, they rethink it as a monster. Monsters in the Greek world tend to be kind of conflated or cut and shut versions of three different animals all jammed together. So they thought that the Sphinx was a monster with the head of a woman, with the body of a lion, and with the wings of an eagle. So there's a Sphinx quite clearly in fragment on this amphora. And this piece of art poses several questions to us and also gives us the key to several answers. These are the kinds of things that we might ask of materials that come from the ancient world. We might think about the social function, for example, of the artifacts that we're retrieving. So this is an amphora. It's a very posh wine vessel. It definitely wouldn't be for everyday use, but you'd have it to carry uh, materials like wine around the Mediterranean. You'd use them for dinner parties. You'd use them for ceremonial and religious events. It teaches us something about ancient technology. We know how pottery techniques would have been carried out in the ancient world. We know how objects would have been crafted and figured out and put together. We also know from the fact that this is a Turkish pot with a Greek story and, uh, painted on it that was discovered in Egypt. So we also know a great deal from this single object about Mediterranean trade networks, Western Turkey, which was ethnically Greek at this period in history, and the Greek mainland and the Egyptian mainland clearly had well-established and well-followed trade links. So this is why we study the ancient world as a whole rather than individual civilizations, because it's also interesting and enlightening to see the various ways in which various countries, various parts of the ancient world would have interacted, would have drawn together. Uh, so we can see that these networks are in play. We can't study Egypt without studying Greece. We can't study Greece without studying Rome. The study of all these nations and all these cultures is all drawn together in one. And linking the Greeks and the Egyptians as well is this tale of the Sphinx, uh, an Egyptian monument which has clearly caught the imagination of the Greeks and which they've reinvented as a monster and turned into something of their own. Now, if you had an amphora, with fancy wine in it, you might pay for it with one of these. This is a coin from the island of Chios, which was at the center of Mediterranean trade networks in the classical period, 7th, 6th, 5th century BC. And on this coin from Chios, we can see a sphinx on the right there, and in front of the sphinx is an amphora. So this is a coin of Chios, and Chios has the sphinx on its coins, the same way that in Ireland, for example, we have Euro coins which are stamped with the harp. Or in France, they might be stamped with a French national symbol or a Spanish or an Italian national symbol. So coins can also tell us something, these physical objects, about how the ancient world thought of itself and how it interacted. Chios, for whatever reason, obviously appropriates the Sphinx myth. It's fond of the Sphinx story. 
So it likes to represent itself through the figure of the Sphinx, which is a national emblem for them, as much as the harp is the national emblem of Ireland. The amphora indicates Chios's place at the center of the trade networks in the Mediterranean. So it's a story from the Greek mainland, from Athens there. You might pay in Athens with a Chian coin for an amphora of wine. And these coins as well then, as they circulate more widely through the Mediterranean world, also tell us a story about how different cultures interact and also help us answer questions about how and where and how extensively did people trade in the ancient world. So another artifact from a museum which can tell us an awful lot, even in just a single artifact, about various aspects of ancient material, the kinds of things that you would study, the kinds of things that you would learn on our program. Once you'd finally got that amphora of wine home as well, you might drink it out of one of these. I wish I could say this object, like the last two, was in our museum. Unfortunately not. It belongs to the Vatican Museum in Rome, and they're very fancy folks. They won't be giving it up to the likes of us anytime soon. But it's a magnificent object, again, with the story of the Sphinx, which seems to be front and center in this artifact. It's a kylix. A kylix is a drinking bowl. It's wide but shallow. And that indicates that it's the kind of object that you wouldn't be drinking from yourself on your own at home. It was probably the centerpiece of a table, the centerpiece of a dinner party, and you would go around the table and each guest would take a sip in turn from this much larger dish. So other questions we might ask of the material that we get from the ancient world are social. What was the social function of these artifacts? This one in particular, seems to be an artifact that had a ceremonial function at dinner parties as folks pledged themselves to each other with a cup of wine. But these bits of material, they also kind of, uh, they tell us the stories, the sorts of stories that the ancients like to tell each other in terms of the imagery, in terms of the visions and the visuals that they're using. So if you imagine this cup full up with wine, as you start drinking from it, you can't see the bottom. But as you drink more and more, and as the party gets more and more inebriated, you finally uncover the bottom of this, and you see this monstrous image of the Sphinx. Here she is on the top right here. This is a story from Thebes in Greece. It's the story of King Oedipus, who was posed a riddle by the Sphinx and successfully answered that riddle, and in so doing, persuaded the Sphinx to stop terrorizing his home city of Thebes. And the interesting thing about this is that it's Athenian ware. It's painted in an Athenian style. It's a myth related to Thebes, both at the southeast corner of the map there. But it was discovered in Vulci to the northwest of the city of Rome in Etruscan territory. So again, it's an illustration of how Greek stories and Greek myths, which were originally, remember, Egyptian stories, Egyptian myths, can pass through the trade and cultural networks around the Mediterranean. These were clearly quite extensive civilizations with extensive links with one another, and we can study in depth the material which interacted between them and what that material meant to them culturally. The Sphinx story is particularly interesting to the Romans. They're not interested in the godhead of the Sphinx. They're not interested that the Sphinx is a representation of a dead emperor. They're not interested in the Sphinx as a monster either, as the Greeks are. What they really latch onto is the concept of the riddle. And that comes up in Roman literature. Roman literature is my own area of specialization. And here's two places in late antique literature, later antique literature, where I've seen the story of the Sphinx in play. The Roman poet Ovid tells the story in the Ibis. Ovid is a poet who's fond of riddles and wordplay, and he uses wordplay himself. He focuses on wordplay as the classic kind of image of the Sphinx, the Sphinx who overcomes enemies by her mouth's dark riddling. Apollodorus, a late antique encyclopedist, also tells the story of the Sphinx. She tells the actual riddle, which the Sphinx posed, what has one voice but is four-footed in the morning, two-footed at lunchtime, and three-footed at the end of the day. I might answer that riddle in the questions or get an answer from you guys if there's time. But the riddle as well is something that we pick up on in the modern world too. And we're also interested in how antiquity is reflected in modern culture. I bet many of you have read the Percy Jackson series. I do see a lot of students now with a great interest in and deep knowledge of the classics that has been inspired by Rick Riordan's series on Percy Jackson. And the Sphinx is a monster who appears in the Percy Jackson series as well in the Battle of the Labyrinth, 
when Percy and his friends play the game show of death with her. And they expect that the Sphinx is going to be a riddling monster who poses them unsolvable puzzles before she eats them all. And they're very disappointed that she's really just a game show host. All that she asks them are a series of dull trivia questions, which they can answer with no problem at all. So this is Reardon picking up on classical culture. As we see so often in popular culture, we see it in the Harry Potter series. There are elements of it in Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit, in all sorts of material from 20th century and more modern kind of takes on popular culture. So classics still inspires us in the modern world today, writers, artists, singers, filmmakers, and so on. So we also look at how classics has an impact on popular culture. So as you'll see, it's a broad subject with a lot of links, a lot of connections to it. We offer various pathways to study it. If you'd like to study it as part of the DN520 program, just the Joint Honours Arts, then you can study it in partnership with any other subject the timetable allows. We get a lot of students coming through with Greek and Roman civilization alongside history, for example, or English or film studies or drama studies. We get some particularly adventurous students who want to study Greek and Latin with it. Now, that's only for the adventurous. It's not necessary to know the Greek and the Latin languages, but we'll maintain that option if you fancy it and you'd be very welcome if you did. Or if you wanted something a little more focused, you could also take the four-year BA Humanities Pathway Programme and take it like Isolt is on Classics, Art, History and Archaeology. Uh, it's the only course in Ireland where you can study all these three subjects together in combination. You can study it as part of Classics, English and History. Or if your real interest was in the languages, you can also study Latin as part of the Languages, Linguistics and Cultures degree. So looking forward to seeing you all, I hope, at UCD at some point in the near future. Hope this was all interesting to you. And uh, Ema, if we have any questions uh, that haven't been answered yet in the chat, maybe we can take them now. A lot of people are wondering, and you'd be happy to hear about teaching classics at secondary school. Yeah, I noticed Mia's question early on in particular, and I guess a few more coming in on the same topic. We are really in need of people to teach classics in secondary school. We have ambitious programs right now. Some of you might have come across uh, access classics, for example, where we'll have people going out into school, we'll have people introducing transition year programs. We're looking to build a strong presence for classics in schools. If you want to do it as a teacher, we will welcome you with open arms. What you need specifically to be able to teach classics in secondary school is 60 credits of Greek and Roman civilization. If you do a joint major in Greek and Roman civilization and something else, you will have enough credits. So you do have enough to satisfy the Department of Education requirements. All you have to do is follow the program through to completion. It doesn't matter what those 60 credits are, as long as they're on a Greek and Roman civilization related topic. That's great. Thank you for that, Martin. Uh, we also have people asking about the types of careers that, grad that students go on to enjoy once they graduate. A lot of people go into museum work of various kinds because this is a great training, particularly with our own museum, to get people the experience to get onto curatorships or to get onto positions where they can train to work and curate in larger museums. So if your interest is in material culture, that's a path which is clearly open to you. Notwithstanding teaching as well, of course, a lot of folks go into teaching. But basically, the skills you learn are about analyzing objects, about analyzing texts, and about thinking about how people work and operate and interact with one another. Those are skills that you can take into any job where there's a human element, where you have to think about planning, where you have to read and interpret things that people have said to you. So I have a lot of people, for example, working in the civil service. We have a student from a few years back, uh, uh, Daniel Alstrom, for example, who has gone into the civil service and worked at the Department of Education and is already in quite a senior role there working on government education policy. We have a few folks who've uh, got jobs in the Department of Finance. So the civil service uh, values very highly the skills that would teach you on a Greek and Roman civilization program. We have a lot of folks who go on and do postgraduate degrees as well. It's difficult to get into a university teaching career these days just because of the pressures on the humanities. But if anyone is interested, we will support you as far as we can in that direction as well. But I would think any role which involves interpreting material, which involves interpreting texts and involves thinking about people 
and how people interact with one another. An employer would very much value the skills you'd learned on a Greek and Roman programme. Thank you, Martin. Isot, I have a question for you. What is the overlap between classics and archaeology actually like? For me, in my pathway, um, there is quite an overlap. Um, we did a, a class called Lost Cities, um, taught by Joanna Day in first year. So that's a really good class. Um, she's a Greek classicist, so or sorry, um, archaeologist, um, classical archaeologist. So her her all of her classes are very rooted in archaeology. So any of her classes, I definitely recommend taking if you want to do uh, combine both of those. And then obviously, if you take it with archaeology, when you're doing archaeology, uh, there's a lot of overlap with um, just the subject matter and myths and just kind of um, material culture and the artifacts that you're looking at. Um, if you are looking at kind of ancient Roman and Greek things, um, there's definitely an overlap there. So yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it can be subtle in certain classes and more overt in other classes. Thank you, Isot. And one final question for you, Martin. What are popular combinations with Greek and Roman civilization in the BA Joint Honours? The most popular that I've seen on registrations are English, are history, and are a modern language in that order. Film studies and drama studies are starting to pick up a few places as well. And there's real overlap between drama studies and the classics because we'll look at a lot of Greek tragedy. My colleague, Professor Lloyd, who's on the stall right now in the virtual O'Reilly Hall, uh, knows a lot about Greek tragedy if anyone wants to go on and chat with him. Strong partner for anything in the humanities, but English and history tend to be the most popular. Thank you to both Martin and Isolt. And thank you everyone for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you soon.